Can I have all the candidates for State Representative District 100 come to the stage? All candidates for State Rep House 100 come to the stage. Again, good evening, everyone. Thank you to one person. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, we are about to begin. Let me introduce myself. My name is Eric Wilson. As you can tell, I am not Sydney Walker. Slight difference. Slight difference. Uh, I want to thank Sydney for allowing me to step in and fill in in her spot uh, for today. Uh, I have big shoes to fill, um, but nonetheless, we have a jam-packed evening for tonight, an exciting evening that uh, we're in store for, and, and first let me begin to thank Miss Molly Belt for putting this on, and Dallas Examiner for continuing this effort. And we'll uh, thank our sponsors as we go through the night and you, concerned citizens and individuals of the community that are coming out, those that are here and those that are streaming live of social media. Again, want to thank you for uh, tonight and to the candidates. We'll begin with a two minute opening. You'll have one minute uh, to answer questions. There is a timer in front of you, so you would raise your hand. All right, she'll let you know how much time you have left and there is a hard stop when it's time to stop, candidates. Audience, audience, I love you, I love you. And I know that you have a lot that you wanna say. You have a lot that you wanna ask. So with that, I do ask that you ask a question. <laughs> that you ask a question. If you begin to tell us your life story, if you begin to say back four scores and seven years ago, uh, I will direct you to ask your question, okay? Also, there are no follow-up questions for candidates. You get your one question. How many questions do you get? I don't think they heard the people in the back. All right, all right, all right. So with that, we'll begin as they are seated with the uh, candidates. I'll let them introduce themselves. You have, we'll start with Mr. Paul Stafford first, and then we'll go across, and then we'll take turns asking questions. When you ask your questions, make sure that you ask the questions that is relevant to all candidates, that all candidates can ask. Uh, if you ask a specific question, then that makes it a little bit difficult for those other candidates to answer again. All right, we ready to go? All right, let's go. Thank you. I appreciate the Dallas Examiner and all of you for being here today, and I appreciate uh, Ms. Belk and all of you for putting this uh, event on. My name is Paul Stafford. I am obviously a candidate for House District 100. I am an attorney. I've been an attorney 26 years here in Dallas. I'm a former prosecutor. I've prosecuted in two counties. I'm a former criminal defense attorney. I've worked for two corporate law offices. I've worked for two large firms. I had my own firm for 10 years. I've been president of two bars, J.L. Turner Legal Association, which um, that was in 2002. I was also president of the Dallas Bar Association in 2012. I'm involved in more than two uh, organizations outside of work. I'm on the board of uh, Boys and Girls Club of Greater Dallas, and I have also worked with Habitat for Humanity to build houses specifically in South Dallas. And you know what? 
the things that I mentioned at the end seem to be what really matters in this race, your ability to talk about your service and your advocacy in the community. Because when you go and work in a volunteer capacity, not go to job, not go to your law job or whatever job you have, but you give your time, your talent, your treasure to something that's important to you by mentoring kids in DISD or talking to folks who need a mentor at a Boys and Girls Center or helping a family to be a homeowner or volunteering to get the vote out or making sure that the legal protections related to election protection are sustained and I've worked in boiler rooms during elections for the past 20 years. Those are the things that are important to a lot of people I've talked to along with having a real voice in the district. My parents were professors at Prairie View A&M. All of my degrees are from public schools. Very strong proponent of public schools. Very strong proponent of education generally. And I would look forward to hearing about your questions and giving you answers. Hopefully that will help you to decide who's the best candidate for House District 100. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Lorraine Garabill, and I am extremely proud to represent House District 100 in the state legislature. Um, District 100 is the place I've called home for 20 years. It's the place that my husband and I are raising our daughter, Natalia. Um, my background, before being elected to the state legislature, I've served in various capacities at the federal, state, and local level, um, helping connect constituents with resources, whether that's through job fairs, small business workshops, community-based nonprofit workshops, um, and I think that's the reason why we've earned so much support. Um, really proud to have the endorsement of Better Work, have the endorsement of Commissioner John Wally Price, Congressman Mark VC, County Judge Clay Jenkins, um, the Dallas AFL-CIO, and many others. Um, but that's not why I'm running. I'm running because I have a 10-month-old daughter. She'll be 10 months, well, 10 months on 28, so we're getting close. Um, but she never got to meet her grandmother. Her grandmother died from metastatic breast cancer because she didn't have access to care. And that was a direct result of Republican decisions in Austin. And that's why I'm running. Not just for her, but for one million other Texans who should have access to health care but don't. Earning too much to qualify but not enough to pay out of pocket. I've heard from the district and I believe that we need a fighter. Someone who's not afraid to stand up and fight for our community. I've been on the front lines in voting rights, health care, education, a whole variety of issues. Uh, one of the things that I did is I sued the state to ensure that every eligible voter had the right to vote and their vote counted. Uh, you may have handouts in your hand uh, relating to that. I want to make sure uh, that every person who wants to vote can vote. On that handout, it has uh, some of the details that allow to make sure that uh, you can cast your ballot. Um, but that's some of the work that I've been engaged in. I look forward to a conversation and a dialogue tonight and wanting to ensure that our community is informed. Uh, if you want to join me in this fight, please visit my website, LorraineForTexas.com, where you can sign up to volunteer or contribute. Thank you. You know. <laughs> Had to do it. My name is Daniel Davis Clayton, and I am running for House District 100. I want to thank everyone for being here today. Why am I running? I'm running because I come from a household of service. My father's a minister. My grandfather was a minister. I'm a little warm, so I'm already sweating. I get that from them. Um, and my mom's a nurse. And my mom's a nurse. Is that better? Thanks. My mother's a nurse. And so we gave back to our community in various ways. And one of the ways that we gave back is that my mom served almost as if she was Obamacare for our community uh, in East Texas. And I went on to become an organizer. I worked for the Texas Democratic Party as a statewide field director. I was the first African American to serve as a exec executive director for the Dallas County Democratic Party. I went on to work for State Senator Royce West for seven years as a legislative aide, and I became the chief of staff for a state representative, Tony Rose, between that time. I also served as the North Texas Regional Director for Enroll America, and I left my job with the state senate to take on that role because I learned that North Texas is and was the most uninsured region in the United States. 
And so I took it upon myself to make a change in health care. And over the course of two years, uh, organizing state, federal, local governments, nonprofits, and businesses, we signed up over 400,000 families in health care. I've also started a social emotional learning program at my son's school as a volunteer. I started a reading program of nine years at my son's school as a volunteer recruiting other parents. Very involved in the community and I believe that the next elected official should be as involved in the community as they are in the campaign. Thanks. Okay, now that we've gotten a chance to know a little bit about our candidates, let's start with the questions. I'll go first. So this is for our candidates. What do you believe are the three most important issues in the upcoming legislative session? What do you believe are the three most important issues in the upcoming legislative session? We'll start with you. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but I feel like healthcare is truly paramount. That's my top priority. I feel like if people are not healthy, they can't participate in the economy, they can't go to school and be educated, um, and do all the things that make for a productive and a happy life. So healthcare is number one for me. Um, obviously, education is also a priority. Um, I'm the only candidate in this race who actually has a plan to pay to fully fund our public schools. Our state only audits one percent of businesses, um, and many businesses, that means 99% of them, are not uh, being audited to remit their sales tax back to the state. And so if we can make sure the schools are fully funded by remitting all of that sales tax back to the state, I think that would be a great step in the right direction. And finally, and I touched on that earlier, but voting rights. Um, voting rights is the gateway to every policy initiative that we want to see happen in our community. And so since our vote is our voice, it is truly critical. The last legislative session, uh, the legislature rolled back some items uh, in regards to voting rights. And of course, I'll be working to repeal that. So I, again, left a job with the state Senate after seven years to pursue health care work. And I still believe that it is the most important issue in Texas. Uh, we were able to get 400,000 people signed up for health care in North Texas, uh, but there's still over a million people left around the state that do not have their health care because the state of Texas did not expand Medicaid. I also have a plan to do that. Uh, I believe that we have to have a bipartisan, uh, a bipartisan effort to expand Medicaid in the state of Texas. There's been a lot of talk from some of our candidates that all we need to do is to win the House back. Uh, but that ignores the fact that we still have a Republican governor, a Republican lieutenant governor, and a Republican speaker of the House. So we have to have bipartisan support and to bring in those rural uh, representatives who are losing their hospitals or their hospitals on the verge of shutting down because we did not expand Medicare. Thanks. What are the three top legislative priorities in a minute? So 20 seconds each. One is the overarching thing, which is to have a real voice in the legislature, period. Have a real voice to talk about more than three issues in one minute. But you're talking about education, House Bill 3. You're talking about legislative solutions. $6.5 billion went into House Bill 3, new money. That's uh, the start of a long-term public education funding strategic plan, a solution for public education. We can talk about Medicaid. That's not one of my top three, because you know what? Until we take back the governor's office and we take back the House, we have to do with what we can do. House Bill 3 has already been enacted. We need to continue that funding. Second issue, we need 200 gun, gun deaths in Dallas not to be an issue. We need to address public safety and reasonable gun control. 40 deaths in May is too many. Economic development is the third. This area has already been designated an empowerment zone. We should capitalize on that with the community involvement to rise all votes. All right, we have a candidate to come in. I'll give you your two minutes for your introduction. You've only let one, have the only one had spoken? You're the last one, yes. Let me cut my phone off. Y'all, I apologize. 
last four. And while we do that, we want to thank our sponsors, uh, NAACP Dallas Chapter, uh, Dallas Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, Metropolitan Dallas Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and Alpha Sigma Lambda Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. What? Sure. You ready? Okay, y'all, when I get a staff, uh, if they'll, we can uh, check here. Mike, please. Mike, please. Okay. This way. Mike, can we for all of us down this way? Okay, then I'll just go ahead and stand this up. Best area is there. Stop right there. Okay. My name is Sandra Crenshaw. My name is Sandra Crenshaw. I'm considered the lobbyist for justice. I'm very blessed to be here. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are asking me, my friends and my haters, are asking me, why doesn't she go somewhere and sit down? That's because I am going to be seeking life, liberty, and the pursuit of justice till the day I die, okay? I'm not gonna let these young folks run over me, and I'm not gonna let them bury me alive. And that's for the rest of the senior citizens to live here, the rest of us to live here. The intent of the Constitution was originally scheduled for the citizenry to serve in public service. It wasn't intended for lawyers to go down there because we've got a little bit too many lawyers. Studies have showed that we've got too many lawyers uh, in this, uh, this city. And the last two lawyers that we've had did very little for the people in this district, for the poor people uh, in this district. I've run in all four city council districts to get the candidates to understand what the rules are and try to do things that are in place. Red flags, when we see red flags in these candidates, we know that they are probably, probably gonna fall themselves in trouble. And we have had too many children go to, their parents go to jail, and we have got to stop that. Okay, we also wanna make sure that the candidates People are always asking us, well, we didn't know that. We didn't know he towed off 5,000 cars from us, okay? And so, thank you. Thank, thank thank you. you. Mm -hmm. All right, now we will open the questions up to our dynamic audience. Do you want to have her a chance to give a response to the question that was asked? Uh, okay, we'll give you the uh, opportunity to answer the question all candidates were asked before you came in, the question was, what are the top three priorities in this upcoming legislative session? What do you believe the top three priorities are in this upcoming legislative session? So is this the question that- That everybody else had prior to you coming, yes. Prior to, did they get an opening statement? Is that yes, what? they did. Okay, I got the opening statement. Okay. And now once you answer, we're all caught up. Okay. In case of those of you that don't know, I had a stroke. And so I am up here giving the best that I can. You know, most stuff is, most stuff is in writing. And um, I didn't get to do that. I'm the only candidate in this race who knows what's for real. Crime is rampant in this community, and it's not the police's fault. We have got to be for real. It is drugs. It is drugs in this community that is bothering us. And we all sat here, just as though we have many relatives that are in pace. Some of our children are uh, addicted to drugs. And we know who you are, but you sit in the legislature, you sit on the city council, and you don't do anything for drugs. So until drugs gets out of our community, until we get a war on the drugs, we are just whistling in the wind messing with the police chief because her job is to enforce the law and it can be a little bit to prevent the law but you're not going anywhere as long as you have drugs in this community Thank you. all right who's first don't anybody jump at once yes 
like to know what policies you guys have all had impressive history and positions already. I'm not talking about your individual work for the community, but what policies have you already pushed and advocated for and what results have you gained as a result of your specific advocacy? Not family members' advocacy, your specific advocacy. In the legislature. Everybody understand the question? In the legislature. Okay. Next. So the policies that I'm pushing for on the trail are the are connected directly to the work that I've been doing in the community. So one of the things that I've been pushing for is to break the school to prison pipeline. And the, re the way that I propose that it's done is that we start a social emotional learning program to train students how to control their emotions, how to uh, de, um, how to uh, de-escalate themselves and de-escalate others. So that's very important. I think that we can use that as a mechanism if we replace uh, elementary and middle school punishment with social emotional learning at that level. Uh, our students are learning trauma and from their peers and at home and they're acting it out at school. And so it's not that they're bad kids, they're just acting out what they know. Uh, we've also worked to secure the vote. Uh, I've been a part of, Thank well, you. my time is up, so. Sam. It's up. It's up. You vote to the two. You're next. You need to go in order. You're next. Sir. We're, sir? We're going down the line. You're next. You're going down this way? Yes, ma'am. So You're next. I did, I went first too. No, it is very no, 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 listen. Listen to me. Okay? The rules of nonprofit organizations <coughs> you have to follow in order. That's what I get after these these debates at all times. I'm trying to understand if I was first and he's next, the next is this. No, group, no ma'am. You're one. you were not first, you were it's part of order and I have a right to ask. You are the last one to give your introduction. We've already started answering questions down the line. Mr. Clayton answers this one. Next question, you'll be the first one to answer it. Then we'll rotate back down the line. And so the next one will be Paul Stafford. No, the next question that after he just answered, mm -hmm. you will get the first question, the next question up, okay? But it's your turn to answer this question. Okay. All right, thank you. What is the uh, question again? The group. What? What? Uh, I'm called the lobbyist of justice because since 2008, I have been before the Texas legislature and lobbied uh, people from all around the state. One of the most important things that I uh, feel very privileged is because um, I was in the food stamp place and the lady said that she would not be able to get food stamps because she was on drug. And I went to Helen Giddings and they told me no and I went to the Harold Dutton, I went to... Um, Alice Allen from Allen, and Dutton said, I did not know that the people could not get food stamps. So what our legislatures need from us is for them to let us know what problems we're having out here. These attorneys that never have been any, never have lived in the ghetto, they don't know the problems that we suffer down here in, in the deals of, of Dallas. And Dallas has the highest number of homeless people, the highest number of poverty, and so we need a person who knows the district, who knows our pain, who can help us. Thanks for your question. I'm on the board of the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Dallas. One of the things I've specifically been asking and lobbying for is additional funding for aftercare centers for people to have a place to go. Sometimes it's the only meal they get. It keeps them off the streets and sometimes they need a mentor. Often they need a mentor. Sometimes it's the only technology that they get. So we need additional public funding for after school initiatives. We also need public funding for um, early childhood development. Those are two things specifically on the education front, aside from House Bill 3. House Bill 3 is a good start, but we need to continue that. On the crime front, we do not need DPS patrolling neighborhoods. They're not designed to patrol in neighborhoods. They're designed to patrol in unincorporated rural areas. 
not neighborhoods. So we need to make sure that they're not in our neighborhoods. Third, Texas Empowerment Zones. That means something because the waivers that we give to Legacy West and other places, you know what? People get forced out of their communities when they have economic development in communities without those waivers because their property taxes go up. So we need to make sure that there are protections for folks that have been here a long time when they get the economic development that they deserve, Chipotle's and other places that you need. Thank you. Um, so in terms of what I have already done, during the, the last round of redistricting, I was actually very involved with the various redistricting hearings, getting people involved with that, advocating for fair lines. Obviously, the lines weren't what we would hope, and so I ended up getting involved in the lawsuit and suing the state over it. Um, thankfully, because of those efforts, and it wasn't, I'm not going to say it's all by myself, it wasn't. Um, but same thing with voter ID, you know, I played a very um, strong support role uh, with the attorneys that were involved in that, finding witnesses, helping with depositions, doing that work to ensure that that law was on return. And as we know, that was successful. The court ended up drawing a court-ordered maps and a court-ordered uh, redistricting law. So. You can back extra time. Appreciate that. All right, next question. Yes, sir. Based on the need of the district um, during the legislative season, what committees will you seek based on the needs of the district? Ms. Crenshaw, this is your question. First. The legislative committee. I was told to stand here. Uh, quite naturally, if you know anything about me, you know that I'm a mental health advocate. And you know that I will be serving on the Health and Human Services uh, Committee. Uh, the chair of that committee for many years was a, a gentleman who had a uh, mental illness. And he is known throughout the country and some of the efforts that people have done uh, for Texas. I feel like I can uh, add a lot uh, to that. I can add a lot to the county committee, and I would also prefer the historical uh, and recreation committee with the uh, state of Texas. Thanks for your question. Chipotle's and Starbucks and other places that you would normally go and not have to drive across the freeway to get there, period. And also, I would talk to whomever we're going to talk to about what committees we serve on, because we serve at the pleasure of you, and we serve at the pleasure of our hopefully democratic speaker, because we need to turn that house and get those nine seats. And so to talk about what committees I want may not be what the reality would dictate. I want to be on education. I have a long history of education. I, my parents and grandparents were professors. I grew up in a historically black college town. My mom went to Tuskegee. My dad went to Prairie View. I teach part time. All of my degrees are from public schools. My kids go to Booker T. I want to be on education. And that doesn't matter at all except that I'm going to do what I'm asked to do for the people and to serve in that way. And one thing about health care, back to your question, I've met with Parkland and Children's and they have community health centers here. We need to increase public funding for those things as well because if the governor doesn't sign the Medicaid expansion bill, then we're not going to get any different result than what we've already got. Thank you. Um, so the speaker has already appointed me to higher ed and urban affairs to finish out the work that Mayor Johnson had begun during the last session. Um, higher ed obviously is very critical. Everyone here I believe agrees that education is a priority um, and having had a plan to help pay for that, I definitely will be working aggressively on that committee to ensure um, that our education is fully funded and that we can have a system of higher education where people cannot necessarily be overburdened with student debt. Um, one of the options that I definitely want to look at, uh, one of the problems and I guess an opportunity for us to solve is that right now when students go to an early college high school in DISD, those 60 credits aren't always counted towards a four-year degree. So not all of those uh, credits, uh, that means that that student may have to go to school for more than two years to complete their um, bachelor's degree. And so I'm going to be working aggressively on higher ed to make sure that that's corrected. Also, I've also been appointed to Urban Affairs. That's been discussed. I see my time turning short. There's an economic development opportunity there. Thank MBE you. compliance is very important to me. Mm -hmm. 
So when I worked as the Chief of Staff for State Representative, I staffed Health and Human Services. Uh, I staffed um, Finance, which is extremely important. You can pass a bill, uh, but if you don't get the money for the bill, then it's a mute point. And I also staffed uh, a particular uh, committee called Calendars, where every single bill that comes before the state house of representatives comes before calendars. So I literally had to read every single bill that went before the state legislature. In terms of what I would ask for, I would ask to sit on Health and Human Services. I think that's very important, uh, particularly because I worked casework for 10 years in the Texas legislature. I would also ask to sit on education that coincides with the work that I've done with social emotional learning and breaking the pipeline to prison. I would also ask to sit on criminal justice uh, because of the work that I've done in the community around the violence in District 100. Thanks. All right, take a momentary pause for the calls and thank our lovely sponsors, the Dallas Alumni Chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Incorporated, Dallas Association of Realtors, Dallas Panhellenic Council, Theta Alpha Kappa, I mean Theta Alpha Chapter of Omega Psi Phi, Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated, all right, with that being said, next question. All right, saw his hand and then your hand. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question to all of y'all um, concerning issues going on in my community, uh, we have a lot of issues going on with bullying in our schools and the lack of safety, but of course that's an issue that's going around, going around the nation. Do you think the state has a role in or to enforce or place fines on parents or put in other measures on parents who whose students are bullying other students on campuses? Would you push for any legislation like that if you were elected for the next session? All right, Ms. Turner. I was bullied into standing in one spot and told not to move <laughs> around, so I'm gonna do that. Thank you for your bullying question. I don't believe that the government should try to necessarily dictate human behavior in all aspects and fine parents for bullying people at school. I think we should try to encourage folks that a school should be a beacon of learning, not just a holding tank, not just a, a teenage daycare. And with that psychology, where you go and you actually try to learn, then I think at least some folks will have less time for bullying and devote more time for learning. Yes, parents should be responsible for their kids, whether the government's involved or not to find a parent because somebody sent a mean text or told somebody an off-color joke or remark, yeah, you can promote that. We have other priorities as well. One of them is giving schools the proper resources and funding to do their job. Teachers ready to teach, students ready to learn, kids ready to go be productive. Um, in terms of the parental aspect of it, yes, I am a parent. I do believe parents are responsible for their children. I don't think finding parents is the proper way of addressing that. I think we need to have a much more holistic approach. Um, I think it's been stated over and over again tonight, schools are not fully funded. I'm the only person here with a plan to address that problem. And I think when we have fully funded schools, that means that we can have more counselors in schools. And uh, I think the, the appropriate measure would be to make sure that these kids have access to proper support mechanism so they can be counseled through the issues that they face so that they are not bullying. Because at the end of the day, that's what the goal is, right? It's not to create some onerous structure uh, that punishes parents when in reality, none of that will actually coach that child through whatever they're dealing with to prevent them from being engaged in that activity. So that would be my approach to it, it would be a, a holistic method. So I've talked about the work with social emotional learning, so I think that's really important. Uh, I have a 14-year-old son that's in DISD schools, uh, so I do not believe that parents should be fined uh, for the behavior of their children. Uh, we had an education forum a couple of weeks ago, and at the time I particularly addressed the lack of counselors at our schools uh, because I work with the counselors at our schools. Uh, there are some counselors that are being shared between two and three schools in DISD. And we need two and three counselors per school in DISD, not only to counsel the students, but also to counsel the parents. 
who also have had their own traumatic experiences that have not been addressed, which they're passing on to their kids. Uh, there are systematic issues in schools, but there are also systematic issues in our homes, and we can't punish our way out of those issues. We have to be compassionate, and we have to take a smart approach to rebuilding families in District 100. Thank you. Thanks. You know, one of the things that I talked about, about crime, we talk about gun violence, and guns are not the bullies. In almost any of the cases, it's been mentally ill people or kids who were bullied in class. I'm very proud to say that Texas has the greatest um, bullying law. It's named after a young man named David who committed suicide after being bullied. And it's, 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 it's appear uh, in the state of Texas. We have a zero tolerance for bullying. But we do need to put more money in mental health uh, agencies and facilities for people that do uh, bullies. Uh, we also have to do one for bullies of adults. I was bullied by Claudia Fowler. I was bullied by Claudia Fowler. And nothing happened to her. And it was against the law what she did to me and nothing was done about it. And people sit here and they laugh about it, but you know what, I could have committed suicide over that, but I didn't. My faith kept me Thank alive. Thank you. Question. Um, gun violence mm -hmm. is a major issue mm -hmm. uh, in our country, and uh, because of our GOP-led legislature, we tend to have uh, very free gun laws that particularly affect our schools and public spaces. Are there any plans that you may have or are considering to address that issue? Um, so I um, have discussed this a many times out, out on the campaign trail. Um, I support um, regulation. Um, so for example, um, having munitions limits um, having red flag laws, um, having universal background checks, an assault weapons ban, you know, I am totally supportive. I'm pretty sure I won't have the NRA support, but that's okay. Um, the reason why I think that's important is because um, you know, as, a, as a state representative, I have sworn to uphold the laws of the state and this nation. And in that role, certainly there is a right to be armed, but no one needs an AR-15 in a public setting, right? Um, you're not using that for self-defense. You're using that to kill people. That is something that is meant for an army, uh, that is meant for a military setting, a war setting, not a civilian setting. And so um, I would definitely support those reforms in Texas. In order for us to get there, though, we have to take back, uh, the first step would be to take back the Texas House. I'm the only person in this race who has successful experience up and down this ballot and throughout the state in doing that. So as the former statewide field director of the Texas Democratic Party, I have experience winning back blue across this entire state as the executive director of Dallas County. Uh, I actually led the effort that led to the first countywide wins in Dallas County. Uh, in terms of gun laws, I support red flag laws, I support uh, universal background checks, but I also think that there's an element that we not, we're not talking about. In District 100, there is urban violence, and I am the only candidate that has addressed that issue. I actually was one of the organizers for Enough is Enough. That was a summit that we held right here in this building this summer to address gun violence in Dallas. Uh, I've been out to King of Cuts with the gang unit and with the state troopers to actually bridge the gap between the community and bridge the gap between the law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. I'll talk, to, talk more about that soon. Again, guns are not the bullies. They're not mentally ill people. One of the things I would like to see done is to put a fingerprint with each gun that you buy, which means that if your gun is stolen, your bullet, your fingerprint will not uh, initiate that gun because a lot of times uh, the gun violence is from people who uh, steal guns. But if a mentally ill person, if he doesn't do it that way, 
then he will do other things. Put poison in your food. Stab you with a knife. Stab people all the time. We need to address our mental illness facility. We definitely do. The Democratic Party needs to put Claudia in place because you, a pulley person who tried to call a person a Negro on the ferret line, I'm, I'm not. Okay. You said what? All right. We have some great questions, and because we have some great questions, Yes, please. Please refrain from using anybody's name. Ma'am, the state law has provided yes, that even the county yes, we and understand. state government can address a person by their first name. We understand. Okay? Thank so you. I Thank you. I continue to do that, and y'all know I'm going to do it. Thank you. We have, because of, we have some great questions. We're almost done. Oh, I'm sorry. State law allows the, the citizens to address people who are in public service. By me. I just me go. John me go. Thank you. There seems to be a trend and a recurring statement. I'm the only person that has. But I'm actually the only person that's actually defended folks that are charged with gun crimes and probably the only person that's, de that's prosecuted folks that are charged with gun crimes. I was a prosecutor in two counties. And when I started prosecuting in 1994, there's something called the Brady Gun Law. That's a federal law. It's passed. It was never fully enacted in Texas. So what does what I have to, talk, to say have to do with Brady gun law? Because the law is already in place. It was never enacted in Texas fully. That's what. So what you talk about is the fact that there are regulations regarding assault weapons ban in a federal law which was never fully implemented in Texas. There are red flag laws in the Brady gun bill from 26 years ago that were never fully implemented here. There are background checks. There are things which we talk about now a generation later, which should have been implemented in this state and have not. There was a package of bills on the governor's office this summer that were rejected. Legislatively, we have to work with communities to make sure that we can form local solutions with problems that caused 200 deaths in our city, 40 in May, for no reason. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful question, but also wonderful sponsors as well such as the Omicron Youth Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce, Greater Dallas League of Young Professionals, North Texas Cluster of Lynx Incorporated, KHBN, The Commish Radio Show, St. Luke Sunday Morning School, Afri and the African American Museum. With that, our next question. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Terrence Perkins. Just have a question about um, kids that would, in, in Texas, we have approximately 12,000 kids in foster care. Recently, the state was sued over foster care, and we all heard in the news how the, uh, the judge ruled and, and refined the foster care agencies. But one way the state got away from, or trying to create a way to get away from being sued, is that they created SSCs, which are single source consortiums. And the single source consortiums are now doing the job of the CPS worker. And, and that question and is? So my question would be, just kind of give them a little history if they didn't know. My question would be, how would you ensure that kids in foster care uh, rights are not violated through the SSC as if they were with CPS to, keep, to stay from getting sued again? Thank you. So when I was working in the Texas legislature, uh, I actually uh, read a bill that was being touted for privatization of, uh, so, uh, of CPS, okay, and I caught it. It wasn't written in that way, but what we figured out was the way they wrote this bill is that they would create private entities, and those private entities would be the people who both went out and did the casework and then also kept all of the case notes and provide those case notes to a judge if there was a problem. And that was the biggest problem with privatizing CPS because there's no checks and balances and there's no entity that can go in and make sure that someone doesn't falsify those notes. So being able to catch those types of things is really important and we are, we're gonna have to have more government insight and we're gonna have to create an ombudsman for CPS and to do thank that. You. 
uh, the judge that ruled in that case was from uh, my hometown, Corpus Christi, and she was a judge who was uh, molested when she was in the foster home. And since she felt that they were so uh, not closely monitored, she put a monitor onto state of Texas that she that's privatized, and they go and monitor that. Texas wants to get back to the situation where they don't have to pay that. I think that any time you have the government that's involved in molesting kids, you should be surprised at the mentally ill people that get abused by the homeless shelters, they get abused by DHA, they get abused by DART. And these people are very frustrated. And so therefore, we need to have people in there who have experience the, the, the things that they go through and try to adjust the, the state to try to monitor this type of abuse. Thank you. A kid is not an acronym. You could talk about CCS, Single Source Consortium, CPS. A kid, a child, an innocent person needs to be treated as such. And you know what? I'm proud of the work that I've done with CASA, and especially the work that my wife's done. We're proud supporters of Dallas CASA. We deal with foster kids and people that are in need and in jeopardy all the time. I'm also on the board of Boys and Girls Club, and I can't even tell you how many kids I've seen that are foster kids or are a product of situations which puts them in jeopardy. What do we need? CPS is terribly underfunded. The government doesn't take the fact that these kids and these situations are putting kids in jeopardy for their teenage years or formative years and into the rest of their lives. And so we need to properly fund and monitor and hold accountable CPS because you know what? We're paying for that and we should ask for accountability because it's that important. It doesn't have to happen to you for you to care about it. You should care about it whether it happens to you because you know what is happening to somebody you know. Thank you. Um, when I think about that, um, I really goes back to the issue that we've been talking about over and over again tonight, which is funding, right? I'm the only person running who actually has a plan to pay for some of the reforms that we want to see. Um, but more broadly, I don't think that privatization is the answer. We've seen what's happened when we privatize prisons. We've seen what happens when schools have been privatized. Um, I think that when it comes to things like education, um, correctional systems, what have you, there are certain things that can't be done well at a profit, right? And so I think the baseline of this is we need to roll back privatization in some of these essential government functions, and then of course make sure that these programs are fully funded so that there is um, a, a way of monitoring the actions that are taken, and not only that, but across the board we need to have raises and we need to increase the number of people who are employed by these agencies because ultimately what I have found in my research with CPS and people anecdotally that I've talked to, there's not enough caseworkers. Man, you all remind me of my 1984 Chevy uh, car that I had that it would take me about five miles before it warmed up. By then I was already there. So with that, we have one more question because we're almost there for this evening. And I want to get someone who hadn't asked a question. Just young lady in the back. You know, I've heard uh, all of the answers that uh, Jasmine and Paul Stafford have given us. And really, actually, all you have to do is live one year. You do not have to, there's nothing that says that you have to know the district, that you have to live in the district. But you know what? I, it really insults me that people live out of the district, come in our district, don't know our pain, don't know the issues that we've gone through, and they're criminal district attorneys, they participate in the system. They cannot help us with criminal reform. They can't help us with that because they participate in the system. They would get blackballed 
if they came in there and really tried to do this. This constitution was set for us to be able to send citizenry there, people that know our pain. Remember I told you about Harold Dutton? He's, a, he's on the Criminal Justice Committee. He had no idea that people were suffering from this. Every time I go to the legislature and every time I go before those committees, I bring real to earth issues and have Thank been you. very successful in getting them done. Thank you. We are allowed to uh, finish our season. Yes, we are. <coughs> Time's up. But, All right, with that, yes, you'll get a, actually you'll get a chance to finish your sentence because we're at the point of closing. So we'll have your two minute closing and we'll start with you. Okay. Again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get out of here. You better tell me something, we're trying to get out of here. All right. That's, that's, that's why you're not a city council right now. I'm actually glad you asked that question. That's a fair question. But actually, I can't speak for Jasmine Crockett, who's not here today. I'm going to speak for myself. I do live in the district. The Secretary of State said I hadn't lived there long enough. But if you look at the election code, it says section 141, it says six months. It says six months. The Constitution says one year. But the Constitution says one year for a general election. And you said yourself that was for a special election. So the law is not clear on how long you have to live in a place for a special election. Not because I wrote the law. I didn't write the Constitution or the election code. So I relied on the election code. I was wrong, according to the Secretary of State. I disagree but we abided by the decision. But you know what? You need a person that actually is a real voice. And if you feel like that person needs to share your exact experience, I understand that. But you need a person that cares about your experience. That's what you really need. Because your experience and my experience are not the same. But a voice that can talk about your experience on the floor is what you really need. And if that means that I don't get your vote because you don't believe I live in your Thank district, you. I understand. <coughs> Um, I have actually uh, lived in the district for 20 years. I'm really proud to call the district home for me. Um, it's where I plan to live for a long time. It's where I'm raising my daughter. Um, I think it's important for people who represent us to live in the district um, because they have a sense of what's going on in the neighborhood. They have a sense of what the needs are. Um, and I'm really, uh, truly grateful that my neighbors have put their trust in me to represent them and carry our issues to Austin. I'll yield my time. So I've lived in the district for the past 15 years, every single day. And I've only lived in two locations. I purchased a home in Buckner Terrace and I lived there for 10 years. And then I moved to South Dallas and I've been there for over five years. And I'm very proud of the fact that I've lived in two different parts of the district because I understand that policy impacts different parts of the district and different social economic areas differently. You can pass one bill and it be implemented differently in different parts of the district. And see, I understand that. And I think that's critical in terms of crafting and creating policies and making sure that they are being executed properly by the uh, state organizations that are executing each of those, uh, each of those policies. Uh, we have to have oversight over policy execution. And that's another critical issue that we have to understand for anybody that's going to become a state representative. Thanks. So now, now that we've uh, asked our questions, we will allow our candidates to have their two-minute closing since we remarks. Late, can you, can the audience entertain a couple more questions since we started? I've already asked, and we're out of time. But, okay. And we would love to hear your closing uh, comments. If you would, thank you. And is it two minutes or one minute? Two minutes. Okay. You know, we've had the highest number of public corruption cases in the state of Texas, in Dallas, Texas. Black. Okay? Now, State Bill 281 just reinforced that this country was founded on the right to criticize our government. And people ask all the time, how come I didn't know this was going on? How did I know that 5,000 cars got towed away? How did I find out that 15 girls were molested? In the, in the, how, how am I not knowing this? And it is because 
Now the government has says, we can now go to city council, we can call people out. I called Mr. John Wally Price out just this last Tuesday because he wanted to get money off of the phone system to charge our people $15 a deal. He was the only commissioner that voted against it. We're only gonna get 1%. And so therefore, I have run in all these four districts, I try to, I, let's, take, let's take for example, the MLK parade. I wanted all of those people on that freshman council person to leave there to destroy a parade that was started by a black man when it was free. When are we going to learn to know our history? Learn that, don't just get in that council and just do what you want to. Know what has happened before. Know the changes that we have made in this district. Quit trying to reinvent the whole wheel and start things all over again. This is what I want to uh, say to, to the public and uh, won't be able to speak uh, correctly to you. But I really, really want you to start paying attention to who you're voting for. There are so many red flags in this race. I only know two and maybe three people in this race that have not already demonstrated all red flags, including not living in the district. That's a red flag. So. I think that it's important that we have people who have lived in the district, that have spent their time in the district, and spent their time in different parts of the district, that understands District 100. I also think that it's important that we have people who have policy ideas that are executable. So I have an idea about uh, breaking the pipeline to prison. I also have an idea about how to stop gentrification in South Dallas. Uh, right now, every two years we have constitutional elections where we freeze the taxes for seniors, for people who are veterans, and for people who are disabled. I believe that we can apply those same types of freezes not only to a person, but to a geography. And if we can do that, uh, we can freeze taxes in areas like South Dallas and West Dallas so people aren't forced out of their homes. That is a serious, serious issue. No one else has talked about this issue on the campaign trail. But it's a concern because I live in South Dallas now. And I think that it's important that we see all perspectives of the district. It's also important that we have someone with the experience in the community. I've worked in education as a volunteer, uh, trying to make the change that I'm looking to see for my children and for the entire community. I've worked on gun violence issues in District 100 spending time at King of Cuts after the owner was gunned down, uh, spending time talking to community members and creating forms so that we can address those issues and take those issues in terms of policy to the state. And I think that's important. I also believe that it's important to have someone that has been in Austin and has worked on bills that have passed. I've worked on bills that have failed. I've worked on bills that failed and then passed in later years. And I know the process in Austin, and I know how to get things done in that environment. Thanks. Again, my name is Lorraine Barabill, and I'm truly honored to represent District 100. Um, for me, uh, this is really uh, quite personal. Uh, this is my home. It's where my neighbors live. It's where we're all fighting for what matters in our community, whether that's education, justice reform, health care, voting rights, and a whole list of other issues. Um, I am uh, deeply moved by what I've heard on the campaign trail and the things that people want to see. But in order for us to see any of those gains, we have to have an approach that has been proven to be successful. So for example, I'm the only person in this race who has picked up support throughout this state. When I was Better Work Statewide Outreach Director in the last cycle, I helped flip 12 seats. And we have all been talking about HB3 all throughout this forum. The reason why HB3 was allowed to happen was because we picked up those 12 seats. The last legislative session was so much better for us, for our community, than it has been in years past because we picked up those seats. Um, so I'm going to bring all of that experience to bear to make sure that we not only hold the 12 that we picked up last time, 
but pick up at least nine more and elect the Democratic speaker for the first time we've had in decades. That is the path for us to do the things such as expanding access to health care, such as making sure that our comptroller's office re ensures that all the money that uh, comes in through sales tax is remitted back to the state so that our schools are fully funded, to make sure we roll back some of the things that the Republicans have done to curtail our voting rights. These are the things that we should be prioritizing. These are the things that we should be working on. And they, I'm the only person in this race that has a proven track record of doing any of these things. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you for your support you've already shown in the community. Uh, we have the most votes in every election so far. I hope that that continues, and I'm thankful for that trust. I'm Paul Stafford. I'm running for House District 100. I'm a father to three daughters, all public school kids, Booker T. I'm a husband to Nikki. I'm the product of college professors. I'm the grandkid of college professors. Education's important to me. I'm your neighbor. I care. I can build allies. We need allies. We can go down the road of talking about who's been here the longest. This is not a contest of who's been here the longest. Because you know what? The issues we've been talking about are pervasive. They've been here longer than we've been talking about who's been here the longest, OK? But here's the real deal. 22% of these freshmen that start in DISD, they ain't gonna graduate. I've volunteered in DISD for three decades. My kids go to DISD. You know what? 18% uninsured, that's the real issue. Highest rate in the nation of kids and adults. We need to not only expand Medicaid, because that's not gonna get us there. You need to talk to Parkland and children and other local health providers to have clinics like we have in this part of the city. We need to address the fact that we had 200 gun deaths and we need to impact legislative solutions at a state and local level to address that. We need to actually use the empowerment zone that we've already been designated to create community-based, community input, economic development. Those are the real issues. I can't vote for you. I can't make you say, well, I'm going to vote on issues and progress. I was endorsed by the Progressive Voters League. I can suggest to you that the issues that we've been talking about need to be addressed and you need to hold your representative accountable. This is a very critical year, not just because of what all of us have been saying, but the census is being taken and the districts will be redrawn in the 2021 session. And so I ask for your vote, StaffordForTexas.com, and I respect your vote. I want to be your voice. My apologies, Jasmine Crockett. Uh, I thank you all for coming out. Um, I have spent my time at the polls. So let me tell y'all something. We need somebody that's gonna work, number one. And I am the workhorse in this race. I am the only one that went out and got petitions to get onto the ballot while everyone else paid to get on the ballot. Number two, we need a fighter. This is a safe democratic seat. So when everybody's talking about expansion of Medicaid and Medicare, we're all Democrats. I don't know who's not going to fight for those things. But what you need is someone that's going to step up and be unafraid to go head to head with the Republicans to get what we need done. This is a majority minority district. And when we talk about a record, my record goes far past what you find on my website. You can Google me and find out that I've been in this fight. Every time somebody wants to run for office, they want to tell you about what they're going to do. Some of us have already been doing it. This is me taking my advocacy to the next level, and that's exactly what we need. It's time out for just sitting there and playing just as sweet as pie. We need someone that's going to be just as loud as the Republicans are when it comes to fighting for their constituents, and that is me. Um, you can visit my website, it's jasmine4100.com. The things that I'm really, really pushing for is, number one, let me be clear, I am the only female attorney that's in this race. And the only reason that that matters is because the job is to write the laws for the state of Texas. And I heard that there was some mention of endorsements. Let me tell you something. There's only four city councilmen that have endorsed in this race period. And three of those four have endorsed me, and it's not because I work for them. I didn't work for not one of those elected officials. My endorsements came because they saw the hard work that I was doing in the streets every single day. That's what y'all need. 
That's what this district needs, is someone that is going to do the work. As Democrats, I think we can all agree that we want to fund education. And as Democrats, I think we can all agree that we need to do something when it comes to our health care. And if we don't have the votes, we need somebody that's going to think outside the box and make sure we get it done. And that's me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's give all our candidates a round of applause. Thank you for your time. If I can have the candidates to exit to their left, and right now we'll call to the stage our next set of candidates, Dallas County Democratic uh, Party Chair. All right, come into the. Come right up, ladies. Come right up. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as you exit, please exit quietly so that we may begin the next set of questions for our candidates. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. For those in the back that did not hear, those in the back that did not hear, as you exit quietly, we're getting ready for our next set of candidates. Thank you, thank you. And we'll do just like we uh, did before. We'll start off with two minute opening statement and then after that uh, one minute for each question and then we'll open it up for questions okay all right let's begin i'll let the candidates introduce themselves seat order hi everyone my name is michelle espinal embler and i'm running for dallas county democratic party chair which is a volunteer position and it's a thankless job and all of these things because my life depends on it. Just like I know that your life depends on it. Getting Democrats elected, not just in this cycle, but for an entire generation, is our only safeguard to protecting our rights and increasing our access to the things that we deserve that are our human rights. Republicans make laws that kill us. I am prepared to fight for our lives because I know what's at stake and I've done it. I've been fighting for a very long time. I started my career in politics as a volunteer when I was 14 years old, interning for the Congress of Racial Equality. I then went on to become the youngest intern in American history for a U.S. Senator working for Hillary Clinton out of the state of New York. Most of you have, might recognize me because I spend all of my free time that's not with my family in South Dallas advocating for the rights and needs of our community. I serve on the board of the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center, now for my second year, appointed by two different council people. And last year, I served as Adam Bazaldua's campaign manager. And I think we can all agree that it ended up being a big win for the community. I'm here, I understand what our needs are. And like I said, I am prepared to fight. My name is Carol Donovan and I am your Dallas County Democratic Party Chair. During my four and a half years as your chair, I have raised over two million dollars for the Democratic Party. And in addition to that, we have made Dallas County bluer. 
Just take this last election season, for example. In 2018, we won back a congressional seat. We won back a state senate seat. We won back the district attorney seat. Anybody know John Cruzo? And then we won every single fifth court of appeals position on the ballot. We won 12 out of 14 state representative seats. And to top it off, we won every county-wide race in Dallas County. Now that's a winning record. And I'm asking you to keep me here so that I can win with the Democratic Party in 2020. Now, I know different candidates have told you about endorsements. I'm not going to list them all, but I'm going to tell you about some of them that I think are especially important. I've been endorsed by the Black Pastors Association. I have been endorsed by Commissioner John Wiley Price. I have been endorsed by Omar Jimenez, and I have been endorsed by every Democratic club in the county of Dallas that endorses. So I think that's important for you to know that I'm not just winning with the Democratic Party. I have proven my record, and these people know I will do the job. Thank you. All right, now that we've had our opening statements, we'll start with questions, and I'll start with the first one. Okay. If elected or re-elected, what would be your three key, uh, three key priorities while in office? You know, a lot of people don't understand that the Dallas County Democratic Party is not an advocacy job. It's not like the state representatives. It's not like state senate. It's basically an administrative job that requires a lot of strategy and a lot of experience. Now I can tell you based on my four and a half years that I've already served that one of my priorities is to get the party even more diverse than it already is. We, we founded, during my administration, uh, a community council that has representatives from every possible constituency you can find. Uh, that committee has been very helpful in us not only recruiting people of different faiths and race and philosophy, uh, but it also has been very important in getting those folks uh, involved in specific projects. And if I was to name two others, I would say I would put together a fundraising council and another strategy committee for the coordinating campaign. So I'll start off by saying that I do not accept being roles being defined by how someone else has defined them. I believe that the role of the Democratic Party, period, is to advocate for the voters that support and maintain the Democratic Party. So I'll put that out there. In terms of my priorities, one is we must incorporate more women-owned and minority-owned vendors in the output that the party does. Like Carol said, she's raised $2 million. Where has any of that money gone to any woman or minority owned business, period? It is not. That's a problem. Secondly, we need to prepare for the future. We need to recruit and prepare candidates, campaign workers, and volunteers. And lastly, we need to win in 2020, and that only happens with someone who is willing to block walk 12 hours a day. You. And you remember I did it while I was nine months pregnant for Adam. Thank you. All right, as we prepare for our questions from the audience, and you've had plenty of time to be warmed up for my previous candidates, we'll take a moment to talk about and appreciate our sponsors, the Dallas Examiner, of course, and the NAACP Dallas Chapter, also the Dallas Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta, Sorority Incorporated, Metropolitan Dallas Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, Alpha Sigma Lambda Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and the Dallas Alumni Chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Incorporated. 
And now we'll open it up to our questions from the audience. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening. Thank you guys for coming out uh, to this forum. My question is this. Uh, and I want to you got an office. I have been requesting that when it comes to the coordinated campaign, that bids be let out so that everybody can have a first shot at um, that uh, process with the coordinated campaign. That means that it is being a, a person is being hired to uh, get out the vote throughout Dallas County. So my question once again is, why isn't it being posted so that everyone can have an opportunity to apply for that, for that position? And that is open to both candidates. First. Me first. So uh, this is a very, very big issue to me. I believe in fair bidding, period, end of story, regardless of what it's for. A lot of you might remember my mother, Jacqueline Espinal, who really led the charge on the fair bidding process for Fair Park, right? So this is in my blood. <laughs> Fighting for transparency and accountability and justice is just part of my makeup. And it's absolutely something that is required for the Democratic Party, because if we're the party of diversity and inclusion and living wage and all of these other very beautiful, happy, progressive thoughts, we have to live it. Otherwise, it's just lip service. And I'm sick of lip service. I'm sick of people asking me for things and not giving back to my community. <laughs> And part of that in, is required to reinvest. We have one of the best consultants in the southern sector, only less than a mile from here. He's never seen a bid for you. this. Thank you. I, I want to correct something, and I don't think Michelle is intentionally misrepresenting. She's just never been involved in the Dallas County Democratic Party. And she's never supported the Dallas County Democratic Party, not even a dime. Uh, first of all, uh, that her statement about we never supporting women vendors or minority vendors, that is untrue. And if anybody wants to know how that over $2 million that I raised was spent, you simply go to the Texas Ethics Commission online and you can see every penny that the Democratic Party has spent. Now, with regard to bids, you know, I certainly do take costs into consideration. I do look at what consultants uh, cost. But let me ask you this. Do you think President Barack Obama, when he hired David Axelrod, said, oh good, he's the lowest bid? No, you don't, you don't hire political consultants based on the lowest bid. You hire political consultants because they win. Hold the mic. Hold on. Next question will be yours. Yes. Okay. My question is good, good afternoon to both of you all. Hi. Now, I went on the Democratic uh, website and it talks about the precinct chair responsibility. We always have a low vote turnout. What do you all have in place? Because we have precinct chairs just occupying that space, name out there, and not working the precinct. And that's my biggest concern, that it needs to be a U-Haul, term limits, because you can't fault the Democratic Party when you're part of the Democratic Party. You're a precinct chair, and then you, I'm looking at some of these precinct chair have been occupying this space for five, four years. Your numbers still haven't moved. So what can you all put in place a measure after so many years? They need to automatically be bumped down because they're not helping the party at all themselves. I know this is a complaint because anybody who's putting out a lot of work resists the fact that other people are not putting out as much work. Well, precinct chairs are elected officials, and the way you get them out is you vote them out of office. Now, evidently, if somebody is in there year after year after year, the people in that precinct must either like that person a lot or they really don't want to be the precinct chair uh, in, that, uh, in that precinct. So I think it's also important for you to know that the numbers have changed. We had the biggest turnout in 2018 that we ever have experienced. And right now, in this election already, with the early voting uh, results that we have, we already know that it is almost 50% higher amongst the Democratic voters than it was in the last presidential election. So we're doing something right. I didn't touch. It went out. It went out? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
Yes. Go down. All right, next question. Answer. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes. So I think that precinct chairs deserve a the benefit of the doubt. I think that, you know, it's a volunteer position. Most precinct chairs spend money out of their own pocket to do whatever work they can do. And so if they're not doing enough, it's a lack of leadership and a lack of direction. I genuinely believe that if someone who signs up to volunteer for a position has the resources that they need to fully execute that, they will do it. I can't imagine that someone signs up for to be a precinct chair without the intentions of doing the absolute best that they could. Um, but there's an incredible lack of support, an incredible lack of leadership that currently exists. I've spoken to over 300 precinct chairs in Dallas County, and they just don't have the resources that they need. Oh, your question. We talk about mental health all the time. When a white precinct chair <coughs> got upset with his people who mugged him and stole his money from him, and he went on his private blog and he said, nigga, and he was removed from being an election judge and if I'm quite sure, he was removed from being a deal. As well as I like him, when I talked negatively about the judge, Anika, uh, can't pronounce her name, uh, we don't do anything when black does something to black. Claudia Fowler committed a law against <coughs> Your question is? And my question is, is why is it did oh, oh. the Democratic Party uh, sanction them. Why did they not sanction them? You took a, one, a white one for talking to them, but you won't sanction the black people. Thank you. Why did you not? So I don't have uh, a point of reference to the specific issue that you're talking about. What I do know is that in every organization, whether it is a governmental body or a nonprofit or a corporation, the culture of that organization is determined by the leadership and that having an environment where we foster respect and care towards one another is the way that we ensure respect and that we're taking care of each other. I've been to CEC meetings and like I said, I've spoken to three over 300 precinct chairs. We have a lack of leadership. We have a lack of care, a lack of respect, and it is seeping to every single level of the organization. We've had so many precinct chairs who have decided to leave because they felt abused or disrespected. It's a culture problem, whatever it is happening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle says she spoke with 300 precinct chairs. I think all of you need to know that before we, uh, before we can run, be on the ballot as chair, we have to get a certain number of signatures. Those 300 signatures, those 300 precinct chairs did not sign her petition. About 70% of all the, all the precinct chairs in the county signed my petition. Uh, and with regard to Sandra's question, and of course she's left, uh, I, will, I will just give you the, a very easy answer. The Texas Democratic Party puts out rules, policies and rules for which we must abide. And in there, there are two ways you can get rid, well, I'll say three ways you can get rid of a precinct chair. Number one, elect somebody else. Number two is if they endorse a Republican. And the third way that you can get rid of a precinct chair is if they fail to attend a certain number of uh, meetings that they're supposed to require to attend. Thank you. All right, again, want to give acknowledge to our wonderful sponsors, the Dallas uh, Association of Realtors, uh, Dallas Panhellenic Council, 
Theta Alpha Chapter of Omega Psi Phi, Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated, Omicron Mu Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce, and we'll have our next question. Yes, my question is, uh, I had came to the Democratic Party and reported a precinct chair that does not live in our precinct and still got to sit in that precinct chair seat. The Democratic Party informed us that the information that we put in was not valuable. My question is, you said only 70% 70 percent signed sure. My question is, are you the one allowing these precinct chairs to do what they want in these communities? Because I live in a community for 14 years and our voting has been down and that same precinct chair been there. So oh. are you going to change this and take the uh, input of constituents who come to the Democratic Party and make reports? All right, and let's make sure we ask our questions so that both candidates can answer those questions. Thank you. Uh, my answer is you're going to do something about it. A lot of people don't understand. These precinct chairs are elected officials. Vote them out if they're not doing their job. Dude, I would say the same thing if a state rep or a state senator was not doing their job. Vote them out. So if your precinct chair is not doing their job, vote them out. I think that it comes down to the idea of organizational culture and the idea that the party should have a sense of responsibility in advocacy for communities. Um, specifically when it comes to whether or not precinct chairs are doing their job, I've already addressed that. I think that that's just that they don't have enough resources and they don't have proper direction. Um, but I think that within an organization, when someone behaves badly, they are to be held responsible. But that can only happen if there is a culture of respect. Um, uh oh, there's an amber alert. Um, and, uh, and so, again, it really comes down to the culture. Uh, and I really want it to be very clear that in terms of the election law and the statute, there's not a lot of regulation over what the county party does. It's pretty, basically comes down to three months of work that they do, which is what we're seeing. Okay. Question? If you will, your phones are going to go off if you don't have if you have not set your amber alert uh, silent. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> taking credit for every democratic race that has been won recently. How much of that is really that chair and, and the budget has not been really signed thirty seven thousand dollar negative last day of twenty nineteen, first day of twenty twenty is a positive, but we don't know by how much we're going to raise the phone. So what will you do? to increase transparency, accountability, and equity within the world. So um, let's look back at some of the things that have been said tonight. Um, you were told that if you have an interest in the party and you want any sense of transparency and you want to know what's happening, go read 400 documents 12 times so that you know what's happened over the last four years. That's just a lack of respect, right? It's pretty simple to say we have spent this much money on overhead. We've spent this much money on consultants. We've spent this much money on feeding our volunteers. We've spent this much money on printing. That's not difficult. Not doing it is just simply a lack of respect. I have respect for you. I have respect for each and every single one of you in this room, and I have respect for the Democratic Party and I believe in transparency. So that's what I would absolutely do differently, is that I would have an open door policy to ensure that every stakeholder, and you're a stakeholder if you vote, period, as a Democrat. You are a stakeholder. You deserve to know what is happening with the party that is t holding the shield. Thank you. Anybody who has ever attended a county executive committee gets a financial briefing of what is going on, how we're spending our money. And in addition to that, they can look at 
online, the Texas Ethics Commission, and they can see every single expense. You don't have to do it 12 times, as Michelle has suggested, and uh, you don't have to read every page. You can hone in on what you're interested in. Uh, you know, the other day, Michelle said, golly gee, Ca you know, Carol says she's raised over $2 million. I don't know where it went. Well, she doesn't know where it went because she hadn't done her homework. You have to go to the documents and look. We have also said at these county executive committee meetings, if you have a question about the finance, come on in. We have a part-time financial director. His name is Bob Franklin. He will answer your questions. And, you know, and if you don't do your homework and you don't come in, it's really unfair for you to say that the process is not transparent. Oh, okay. No, I already answered this. All right. <laughs> All right let me ask. Let's again, though. Let me ask a question. Uh, this goes. This goes to you. All right. Describe your vision for the Dallas Democratic Party and areas that you think the party can improve and how? Ladies and gentlemen, there is absolutely no process and no organization that can't benefit by improvement. And I would say that in a perfect world, if I am not working on helping to elect all the Democratic candidates, that my vision includes and a much more diverse party, even more diverse than it already is. It includes having a connection with Stonewall uh, Democrats. It has a connection with all the Democratic clubs to a much more formal degree. It also has a connection with young Democrats. And we, in fact, do joint projects with the young Democrats. So I don't want anybody telling you that we don't work with young Democrats. Uh, so, in regard to that, I would say, as I know a lot of people don't want to hear about this, but money really helps. And in a perfect world, I would have a development board that would assist me in raising money for the party. All right, probably not going to finish this in the one minute that I get, so I'll finish in my closing statement, but I'm going to go as fast as I can. First is we've got to open up the coordinated campaign to fair bidding and break it into four pieces so that experts are hitting the marks so that we win really, really big in 2020. Second, we have to prepare for the future. That means that we need to invest and create the infrastructure that we are recruiting and preparing future candidates, future campaign workers, and volunteers. These things do not come naturally. And the people who walk through the door wanting to do it, we're leaving a lot on the table if we're not actively making that accessible. And then really big picture is that we do need to advocate. And we need to stand up and say, and, and hold our elected officials accountable, whether it's Republicans or the Democrats, and say, this community voted for you, and we are here together to be the voice to hold your feet to the fire. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I have looked at the Texas Ethics Commission's filings, and I have seen that um, the party's running in the red, that fundraising um, last year, as of July 2019, was about uh, $365,000, most of which went to three events. Um, those events netted very little money in terms of fundraising. So, in, so for the party to be able to be sustainable and do the work of getting out the vote, what is the plan? Yeah, so um, as was mentioned, uh, I've also looked at the, the financial records, and I was going to address that in my closing statement, but I'll address it now. And we, the party is currently spending a lot, a lot of money on fundraising, which means that it's netting very, very little. And of what it does net, it spends on either overhead for salary staff, or it all gets funneled to one printing service or one consultant, neither of which are bid for, which 
again, it's kind of like my pet peeve. This is my big deal because it's not fair and it's not transparent. Um, so that's the first thing to fix. We literally would net more dollars if we went door to door with a boot asking every person who's voted as a Democrat to give us 25 cents. And that is literal numbers. So when we talk about money that's come in versus money that's actually been used, we're at a negative rate. We can do better. You know, Michelle has used the word transparent several times, and I know Michelle would want to be transparent and have full disclosure that the question was asked by her mother, uh, who was asked to run against me for chair before Michelle ran. But in any event, your description of the finances is incorrect. I have also had conversations with you about that. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization. There are some months that are bleh, and there are some months that are really great. And what's important is in the end, we're making money. And for example, when Michelle described these events that just made nothing, she certainly wasn't looking at the last Johnson Jordan dinner, which raised over $300,000. And I don't think you're gonna get that with a boot going door to door. Uh, and if that's your plan, Michelle, I'm really worried about the, about the uh, party's welfare, uh, especially since you yourself have never paid into the party, ever. My, 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 what's the old saying? Time flies when you're having fun. And guess what? Our time in here is just about done. So with that, we're going to move towards our closing statements from our candidates. And since you started, then we'll begin with you. All right. Thank you. You know, a lot of times people assume that candidates don't like their opponents. And I just want to tell you, that's not the case here. I like Michelle. I think she's an attractive, articulate candidate. I think that she's a leader. The problem is that Michelle has never rolled up her sleeves and done an ounce of work for the Dallas County Democratic Party. And for her to tell you that she should somehow get credit for managing a city council campaign over here or being involved in some organization over here, I mean, that's, that doesn't even make sense. That'd be like me saying, hey, I did volunteer work for the Red Cross, now I want to be head of the Dallas County Democratic Party. And another thing, if someone was to walk into any of your organizations, never having seen them before, and never having been involved before, and then for them to say to you, hey, I want to be your president, that's not going to go over and I ask that you don't let it go over here. Now, if according to the rules of the Texas Democratic Party, if Michelle gets elected as Dallas County Democratic Party, she officially takes office in June, five months before the 2020 general election, which means that she would have to come up to speed on, in five months for everything I already know. If you elect me, there is no gap in office for your chair. If you elect me, I work for you for free, continuously through the November election and afterwards. And I tell you what, 2020 is the most important election of our lives. This is not the time to switch horses particularly when we are doing such a great job for you. Okay. Thank you everyone again for coming out and being here. I know taking your Monday night to listen to, to us speak isn't like the most awesome Monday night, so I really appreciate you being here. Um, I want to be very, very clear. I am a servant. I have dedicated every single moment of available time in my life to being of service. This is what I care about. This is what I'm driven to do. 
I'm not seeking this for some accolades or for a title or for a position. You know, I've never heard my opponent say why she wants this. I know why I want this. Like I said, I don't trust what's happening currently. I think there's a lack of leadership, there's a lack of transparency, and there's a lack of care for the future. And damn it, my life is at stake. Your life is at stake. We need a fighter. We need someone who understands that we have a voice and we deserve a voice. And to say that I haven't been involved with the party is really disingenuous. I served on the board of Dallas County Young Democrats for three years, during which time we never got any institutional support. Now, of course, the minute I started saying that, they got institutional support. So no matter what happened in this cycle, it's been a really big win. But I know that in order for us to meet our goal in 2020 of changing the horse in the race, because that's what we all care about in 2020, right? Is we want to change who the occupant in the White House is, and that is all that matters in our immediate foresight. In order to do that, we have to get big, we have to get bold, and we have to fight for it. I am prepared to fight for each and every one of you to make sure that that happens. Right, let's give our candidates a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for this awesome opportunity. And good night.